The Flip Side, Disc 2 The Lottery Winners On the evening of the 22nd of May, 1999, police officers were called to a house in the fashionable Kingwood area of Houston, Texas. When they arrived, the officers found the owner, a man by the name of Billy Bob Harrell, shot dead in an upstairs bedroom. According to the investigators, Harrell had taken his own life. He had locked himself in his bedroom, stripped himself naked, pressed a shotgun barrel against his chest, and pulled the trigger. Shortly before his death, Harrell had confided to a financial advisor about the event that had occurred just twelve months previously, which he said had ruined his life. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me, he had lamented. Yet, this episode was not an incurable illness or loss of a loved one. He hadn't been involved in an accident, and he hadn't lost his job. He and his family were all alive and well. So what was the terrible event that had ruined his life? The chance of this particular event happening to Billy Bob Harrell was about one in forty million. There was a greater probability of being hit and killed by a bolt of lightning while out walking the dog, if he had walked a dog. But as fate would have it, the event in question happened one evening as he sat at home reading the newspaper. He read and re-read the sequence of numbers on the page. Suddenly it dawned on him. He had the only winning ticket to the Texas State Lotto. He had won the jackpot. Ridiculous as it may seem to most people, the event that Harold later attributed to ruining his life and which led to his suicide was winning $31 million. When one takes a look at the biographies of many lottery winners, one discovers that Billy Bob's experience is by no means unique. Estimates suggest that in the USA, over one-third of all lottery winners end up bankrupt. William Bud Post won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania Lottery in 1988 and ended up penniless, living on Social Security. When interviewed, Post said, I wish it never happened. Winning the lottery, as far as he was concerned, had been a nightmare. Post's nightmare started when a former girlfriend successfully sued him for a share of his winnings. Later, there were reports that his brother had been arrested for hiring a hitman to kill him, in the hope of inheriting a share of William's winnings. Other siblings allegedly pestered him, although not with such grievous intent, until he agreed to invest in a car business and a restaurant in Sarasota, Florida. These two ventures only served to cause further strain on his relationships with his siblings, and, of course, lost him more of his money. Not long afterwards, Post was sent to prison for firing a gun over the head of a debt collector, and within a year, he was not just penniless, he was one million dollars in debt. Post admitted he was both careless and foolish in trying to please everyone in his family. Eventually, he filed for bankruptcy. According to reports, he lives quietly on $450 a month and food stamps. I'm tired, I'm over 65 years old, and I just had a serious operation for a heart aneurysm. Lotteries don't mean anything to me, he says. In the UK, there are similar stories. In 1996, John McGuinness was the envy of every person who had ever purchased a lottery ticket in Scotland when he scooped over £10 million, a record-beating sum won by a Scot. At that time, McGuinness had just separated from his first wife and he'd been sleeping on the floor in his parents' home in Lanarkshire. After winning the jackpot, he splashed out on, among other things, a Spanish villa, a Porsche, a Bentley and expensive holidays. However, by July 2007, McGuinness was declared bankrupt with debts totalling over £2 million. In relating these stories, I'm not suggesting in any way that all lottery winners end up wretched or dead. Many live up to our expectations and go on to live very happy lives. According to Camelot Group PLC, 
who conducted a five-year study, 55% of lottery winners are happier, at least in the first five years, after winning. Perhaps we could all learn something from lottery winners in Norway. Researchers from the Institute of Psychology at the University of Oslo sent a postal questionnaire to 261 lottery winners of prizes of 1 million Norwegian kroners or more in the years 1987 to 1991 and found that the average winner was a middle-aged man of modest education from a small community. Most winners in Norway were cautious and did not go on spending sprees. They'd also requested anonymity and tried to keep their windfall a secret. Whatever the reasons, the results of the survey indicated that the quality of life for most of the lottery winners following their newfound wealth was stable or improved. What these stories suggest is that a sudden increase in wealth, even substantial wealth running into millions of pounds or dollars, is not a guarantee of happiness. According to Dr. Edward Diener, professor of psychology at the University of Illinois, once our basic needs are met, more money has little impact on our feelings of happiness. Through his research, Professor Diener discovers that happiness was only marginally influenced by money, education, IQ or age. The most significant characteristic shared by the 10% of students with the highest levels of happiness and the lowest levels of depression was a strong social network. It turns out that more than any other single factor, it is our connections to friends and family and a commitment to spend quality time with them that improves our happiness. This is why Dr. Dina advises that it is important to work on social skills, close interpersonal ties and social support in order to be happy. Winning the lottery can have the exact opposite effect, as winners can feel isolated from their friends and family. However, the main point is this. Many people dream of winning the lottery and believe that it will be a passport to guaranteed happiness. But that dream can quite easily become a nightmare. It could turn out to be the best thing or the worst thing that could happen to you. A new meaning to life. Just as winning the lottery is not always a guarantee to happy ever after, a tragic accident that leaves a person paralysed is not necessarily a life sentence of misery. There is no better example of this than Johnny Erickson Tada. Johnny, spelt J-O-N-I, was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 1950. She was the youngest of four sisters, Linda, Jay and Kathy. She was named after her father, John. Johnny inherited her father's athletic and creative abilities, giving father and daughter a special bond. Her childhood, she says, was an extremely happy one. She grew into a young adult, surrounded by love, happiness and security in her parents' home. All of her family shared a great love for the outdoors, enjoying various outdoor activities such as camping trips, horseback riding, hiking, tennis and swimming. It was on a hot summer's day in July 1967, just after graduating from high school, that Johnny's life changed forever. Johnny was to meet her sister Kathy and some friends at the beach on Chesapeake Bay for a swim. When she arrived, Johnny dived in quickly and immediately knew that something was wrong. Though she felt no real pain, she later explained that a tightness seemed to engulf her. Her initial thought was that she was caught in a fishing net and she tried to break free and get to the surface. Panic seized her when she realised that she couldn't move. She found herself lying face down on the bottom of the bay. Realising that she was running out of air, she resigned herself to the fact that she was going to drown. Johnny's sister Kathy called for her. When Johnny didn't surface, Kathy ran into the water and pulled her up. To Kathy's shock, Johnny could not support herself and tumbled back into the water. Kathy managed to pull her out of the water and Johnny gasped for air. 
Johnny was puzzled as to why her arms were still tied to her chest. Then, to her horror, Johnny realised that her arms were not tied, but were draped lifelessly across her sister's back. Cathy yelled for someone to call an ambulance, and Johnny was rushed to the hospital. It didn't take long for the doctors to diagnose that Johnny had broken her neck. There was a fracture between the fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae, which left her paralysed from the shoulders down. Lying in my hospital bed, wrote Johnny, I tried desperately to make sense of the horrible turn of events. I begged friends to assist me in suicide, slit my wrists, dump pills down my throat, anything to end my misery. But Johnny survived, and has gone on to find the flip side and live a full and happy life. I have discovered many good things that have come from my disability, she says. More significantly over the years, Johnny has helped and touched the lives of thousands of people all over the world. Initially, Johnny learned to compensate for her handicaps. Being naturally creative, she learned to draw and paint, holding her utensils with her teeth. She developed a talent and was creating work that by any measure was a great success. She began selling her artwork and gained for herself a degree of independence. Johnny also became a sought-after conference speaker, author and actress, portraying herself in the worldwide pictures production of Johnny, Her Life Story, in 1978. She's written several books including Holiness in Hidden Places, her autobiography Johnny and a number of children's titles but her most satisfying and far-reaching work became her advocacy on behalf of the disabled community. In 1979, Johnny moved to California to begin a ministry to the disabled community around the globe. She called it Johnny and Friends Ministries, J-A-F Ministries, which she says became her vision of fulfilling the words of Jesus in Luke 14.13. Call to the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you shall be blessed. Johnny understood only too well the loneliness and alienation that many people with disabilities face, and it wasn't long before her ministry was immersed with calls for both physical and spiritual help for the disabled. Through JAF Ministries, Johnny records a five-minute radio program called Johnny and Friends, which is heard daily all over the world. Her role as an advocate for the disabled led to a presidential appointment to the National Council on Disability. Johnny has also begun Wheels for the World, a ministry which restores wheelchairs and distributes them in developing nations. Johnny Erickson Tadda is an outstanding example of of how one of the worst tragedies someone can experience in life can be transformed into a life-affirming event. Like the two paralysed men contributing to the discussion following the play Whose Life Is It Anyway, Johnny looks back on the events of that afternoon in July 1967 without regret or bitterness. She believes that it led her to places she wouldn't have seen and people she wouldn't have met and achievements she wouldn't have accomplished. In doing so, the accident brought new challenges and much greater meaning to her life. Reflecting on the fates of Billy Bob Harrell and the other lottery winners, compared to people like Johnny Erickson Tada or Julio Iglesias, raises a number of questions about our own lives. The things that happen to us in life do not, by themselves, dictate our future happiness or success. Their stories suggest that there is something more significant and more powerful than any situation in which we may find ourselves today which will determine the quality of our lives tomorrow. But what is that something? The Lesson of the Taoist Farmer It is neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. William Shakespeare The ancient Chinese philosophy of Taoism provides an insight 
that can help us to better understand the differences between the stories of Billy Bob Harrell and Johnny Erickson Tada. Taoism began in the 4th century BC through the teachings of a man called Lao Tzu, author of the Tao Te Ching, which has become the classic text of Taoist thought. One of the most used symbols of Taoism is that of water. Water is in many ways a Taoist ideal because at the core of Taoist belief is the notion that life is like the continuous flow of water in a river. The Taoist accepts that at times the river's current may take us to places that we would prefer not to visit and to experiences that we would choose to avoid. But Taoism offers a message of hope. Hope in the knowledge that although we are not always able to influence the flow of events, we are always able to maintain control over our thoughts and beliefs. And control over our mindset is infinitely more powerful than anything that can happen to us. Taoism also teaches us to look at events in our lives without judgment or interpretation. According to Taoism, nothing is of itself good or bad. This may seem counterintuitive, although less so when we reflect upon the lives of Billy Bob Harrell and Johnny Erickson Tada. It is best explained through the parable of the Taoist farmer. The Taoist farmer lived in a remote village in the furthermost corner of China. He was not a wealthy man, but he was content with his life and farmed a small plot of land with his son and wife. One day, a wild horse galloped onto his land, jumped the fence, and began grazing in the farmer's field. According to the provincial law, the horse now rightfully belonged to the farmer and his family. The farmer's son could hardly contain his excitement. But the farmer put his hand on his son's shoulder and said, Don't be quick to judge. Who knows what's good or bad? The following day, the horse broke out of the field and galloped away. The farmer's son was heartbroken. Don't be quick to judge, said his father. Who knows what is good or bad? On the third day, the horse returned with four mares. The farmer's son could hardly believe their good fortune. We're rich, he shouted. But again his father said to him, Don't be quick to judge. Who knows what is good or bad? The following week, while riding one of the horses, the boy fell and broke his leg. The farmer ran to get the doctor. Within a short time, both the farmer and the doctor were tending to the boy, who was moaning and complaining about his miserable fate. The farmer wiped his son's forehead with a cool, damp cloth, looked deeply into his eyes, and reassured him once again. My son, do not be too quick to judge. Who knows what is good or bad? The following week, War broke out in the province, and army recruiters came through the village and conscripted all of the eligible young men. All except for one young man, who was unable to fight due to a broken leg. The story of the Taoist farmer is more than an affable ancient fable. It offers a simple yet vital lesson on our journey to the flip side. On the day that something happens, or for that matter weeks, months or even years afterwards, it is impossible to know what significance the event may have on the rest of our life. A good example of the lesson of the Taoist farmer came at the British Open Golf Championships in July 2008. When Porrick Harrington injured his wrist in the run-up to the Open, he had no idea the injury would be a blessing in disguise. The day before the start of the tournament, Harrington said his wrist had been so sore that he genuinely felt that in the balance of probabilities he would not be able to play. The British Open is the oldest of the four major championships in men's golf, dating back to 1860. The 2008 championship was particularly meaningful to Harrington because he was defending champion and the prospect of not being able to play would have been a huge blow. However, as it turned out, the wrist injury that nearly stopped Harrington from playing, according to Harrington, 
was in no small part responsible for him going on to become the first European to successfully defend his title since James Braid in 1906. It was a great distraction for me, Harrington said after winning the title. There's no question, the injury pushed everything about coming back to defend the title to the side. There's an element, when you're an open champion or a major champion, of trying to live up to it all the time, and that can be a burden. But the injury took a lot of pressure and stress off me. It was a good distraction. Harrington went on to explain another flip side to his injury. To safeguard the wrist, he had only been able to play nine holes in practice before the Open began, meaning that he was fresh going into the most demanding week-long tournament of the year. The wrist injury was a saviour for me, really. Sometimes the flip side comes quickly and is obvious, as Porrick Harrington discovered. Other times it may take months or years, or even a lifetime, to find the flip side that lies hidden in a major setback. Reaching for the Sky On the 14th of December 1931, a crowd was gathered at Reading Aero Club, watching in awe as a talented young RAF pilot, just 23 years of age, demonstrated low-flying aerobatics over the airfield. Suddenly, their awe turned to horror. As the plane came out of a roll, the tip of the left wing touched the ground and the plane rolled and crashed. An ambulance was on hand to attend to the pilot immediately, but the pilot had suffered severe injuries. Both of his legs had been crushed. The pilot was rushed to hospital and was fortunate to be seen by one of the most prominent surgeons of the time, Mr. Leonard Joyce. The injuries were too severe for even Mr. Joyce to repair. The only option available was to amputate the pilot's legs, one below the knee and the other slightly above the knee. In the days following the accident, the pilot made an entry in his logbook. Crashed slow rolling near ground. Bad show. He didn't know then, but the loss of his legs would, in the years ahead, help him to become a legend as an RAF fighter pilot in the Second World War, and this in turn would lead to him being knighted. However, even more significantly, the accident that cost him his legs would one day, in the future, save his life. Douglas Bader had been an outstanding sportsman. He had played rugby union for Harlequins, and according to some reports, had the potential to play at international level. He was also a very competent cricketer. One would have thought that the loss of his legs would have been enormously difficult to bear. But Bader was focused on two very specific goals, being able to walk again and to fly. Though in constant pain that required him to take morphine at times, Bader remained determined and worked tirelessly. Within just six months, he achieved his goals. Not only could he walk unaided, but he was even able to dance and play golf. And in June 1932, he flew again. Yet, despite his valiant efforts, in April 1933, the powers that be invalided him out of the RAF. One major flip side to his ordeal came quickly. His time spent in recuperation brought him into contact with a beautiful young nurse, Thelma Edwards, whom he married in October 1933 and remained devoted to until she died many years later. Six years after Bader had been forced out of the RAF, Europe was plunged into war the likes of which had never been seen. Bader was determined to help in the war effort and pulled whatever strings he could through his old contacts to get re-enlisted. With the need for pilots to help in the war effort, the RAF accepted Bader's application and after a short refresher course on the latest fighter planes, including Spitfires and Hurricanes, he was given an operational posting. He was 29 years old, much older than most of the other pilots, and he wore prosthetic legs, but Bader proved to be one of the best RAF fighter pilots to fight in the Battle of Britain. By August 1941, Bader had shot down 22 German planes. 
only four other pilots in the RAF had shot down more enemy aircraft. The remarkable thing, as far as the search for the flip side is concerned, is that Bader's success was not in spite of the fact that he had no legs, it was largely because of the fact that he had no legs. One of the observations of aerial combat was that when pilots pulled out of turns at speed, the flow of blood could drain from the brain to the extremities, causing temporary blackout. But as Bader had no legs, his brain didn't lose nearly as much blood flow. As a result, he could remain conscious that much longer, which gave him a significant advantage over the abled-bodied enemy pilots against whom he fought. However, the real flip side came on the 9th of August 1941, when his plane collided in mid-air with a Messerschmitt over Le Touquet in France. As he tried to bail out, Bader became aware that his right prosthetic leg was trapped. The plane careered towards the ground. Any other pilot would have been facing certain death. But it was because Bader had no legs that he survived that day. The strap holding the prosthetic limb snapped. And it was only then that group captain Sir Douglas Bader was able to extricate himself from the doomed plane just in time. One could argue that the positive outcome from a negative event is nothing more than the result of the randomness of life. On the balance of probability, there will always be some people who end up benefiting in one way or another from a personal tragedy or crisis, just as some people will end up disadvantaged and miserable following a personal achievement or success. However, following literally decades of research, scientists and psychologists have begun to discover that the secret to finding the flip side does not, in fact, lie in the event itself. It lies in our response to the event. Every setback in life, every trauma, has two sides. But it takes a special type of person to find the flip side. Chapter 5 The Two Sides of Trauma Why trauma is not always destructive and can often lead to profound and positive changes. If you think about all of the heroes and heroines in cultures across the world, all of them, in one sense or another, faced some sort of dragon. The transformation from that encounter has been celebrated from antiquity. Professor Matthew J. Friedman The term trauma comes from the Greek meaning wound or injury. However, when we refer to a traumatic experience, we usually think of a deep psychological wound. It is an event that leaves a deep imprint on our body and on our psyche. It can literally smash our core beliefs about life and its meaning. And in doing so, it can overwhelm us to the point of despair and depression. It can destroy us spiritually and mentally as we struggle to come to terms with the loss and suffering that it often brings. It is said that only two things are certain in life, death and taxes. But traumas will also touch us in different times and in different places. At some point in our lives, most of us will face trauma of one kind or another, and usually it will come suddenly and with no warning. However, trauma is not necessarily destructive. It has another side, a side that can change our lives profoundly and for the better. The Fork in the Road You reach a fork in the road where you make a decision. You're either going to be a victim and live a life certainly not to its fullest, or you're going to choose this huge opportunity for growth. Uta Lawrence The King's Highway 401 in Canada extends for 815 kilometres and runs across southern Ontario joining Windsor to Montreal in Quebec. It is one of the widest and busiest highways in the world 
and carries more traffic than any other road in the whole of North America. The westernmost section of road between Windsor and London is noted as being the busiest stretch of road for trucks in North America. It also has the distinction of being one of the deadliest roads in the world. In fact, there have been so many accidents on that stretch of the highway that it's become known as Carnage Alley. The main cause of the accidents on Carnage Alley is generally attributed to the poor design of that section of the highway. It has narrow lanes and soft shoulders rather than hard shoulders, which means that the innermost lane is even narrower than the standard lanes. As a result, motorists caught in the inside lane have nowhere to go to avoid collisions. The third problem is even more hazardous. The highway has a very narrow grass midline, and therefore there is very little to protect drivers from cross-directional collisions. This was always one place where accidents really were waiting to happen. The worst of all the accidents on that stretch of the 401 happened on the 3rd of September 1999, Labor Day weekend. The 401 was filled with holiday traffic when a heavy curtain of fog draped over the region. With such bad visibility and the inherent danger of that stretch of road, what happened next may have been inevitable. It became the scene of the most horrific pileup ever in Canadian history. 87 vehicles were involved, 45 people were injured, and 8 people died. Uta Lawrence and her husband Stan Fisher were in one of the cars in the pileup that day. In one way, they were fortunate, neither of them suffering more than a few cuts and scrapes. However, although not physically injured, they were both left deeply traumatized by what happened that day. During the pileup, a 14-year-old girl became pinned against the Lawrence's car by a van. The girl was crushed against the passenger door, and Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence watched in horror, helpless, as the girl burned to death. Uta Lawrence had been a journalist and publisher, but her life changed forever the day of the accident. When she went back to work the following Tuesday, she became aware that something about herself was not the same. I used to get up full of excitement about the day, she says. All of a sudden, you have an event like this, and it destroys everything. Your belief system, your self-esteem. I used to be a decisive business person. Two days later, that person was no longer there. It wasn't long before she found herself unable to work alternating between states of numbness and near hysteria. It was two months later that she finally sought help and consulted a doctor who referred her to the trauma center at the local hospital. According to the U.S. National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, up to 60% of the population experience some kind of trauma during their lives. Current figures indicate that about 8% of the U.S. population suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and over 5 million people receive treatment for PTSD every year in the U.S. In the U.K. and Canada, the proportionate figures are very similar. According to the Canadian Mental Health Association and the online information service Patient UK, as much as 10% of the Canadian and U.K. populations suffer from PTSD at some point in their lives. However, from these figures, it's interesting to note that of the people who experience a severe trauma, only a relatively small minority end up suffering from PTSD. The vast majority of people don't suffer severe or lasting adverse reactions to traumas. Uta Lawrence started experiencing symptoms of PTSD within days, she was profoundly affected by what she had witnessed. I used to be a very aggressive and decisive person, she said, and that person two days later was no longer there. She was unable to conduct anything on a day-to-day -day basis, from keeping a kitchen clean to running my business. Uta consulted her doctor and ended up trying pretty much all of the available treatments, as well as taking a variety of self-help courses and seminars. Recovery took years. But the process 
set her on a new career path, providing support for PTSD victims and raising awareness about what is a staggeringly prevalent mental health disorder. She woke up one day and experienced something of an epiphany. She and her husband would found the first PTSD self-help organisation in Canada. In 2006, the Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Association was formed to provide advice, help and support to people across Canada who are suffering from PTSD. Through the association and its work, Uta Lawrence and her husband had found a flip side to their trauma. Their experience inspired them to a mission, not just to help people come to terms with a traumatic experience, but to help and inspire them to find something positive in their experience, something that could become a catalyst for personal growth. When interviewed in the Globe and Mail newspaper in August 2008, Uta Lawrence said that when people reach a fork in the road, they have to decide whether they're going to be a victim and live a less than full life or choose to find the huge opportunity for growth which is always there waiting. This is the flip side. In her parting comment, she reminds people that when faced with any form of traumatic event, even one as horrific as the one she witnessed, there is always a flip side. You've had a horrifying experience, and the more difficult it is to get over it, the bigger the opportunity to grow into a more compassionate, giving person. Post-traumatic growth The positive psychology of growing through traumas is a much more fascinating topic for study than post-traumatic stress disorder because such knowledge can help increase individual resilience and reduce mental illness. Paul T.P. Wong that severe trauma or loss can be a precursor to positive change and a better life is not as incomprehensible as it might first seem. There is much to support the belief that anything that does not kill us makes us stronger. For example, when we survive an infection, particularly a viral infection, we acquire a certain amount of immunity. We also benefit from the knowledge that the infection can be beaten. Similarly, if we have the misfortune to break a bone, but the fortune to have it reset properly in its correct position, the healing will lead to a much stronger fusion. The bone will regrow stronger than it had been before it was broken. In much the same way, psychologists have discovered that a psychological trauma, if responded to in the right way, often creates a stronger character and leads to what they refer to as personal growth. In April 2004, the Psychiatric Times published an article that raised some eyebrows in the world of clinical psychology. The authors, Dr. Tedeschi and Dr. Calhoun, professors of psychology at the University of North Carolina, had devoted over 20 years of their careers researching the impact of severe physical and emotional traumas on people's lives. Their findings brought surprising conclusions that challenged the accepted wisdom about the nature of traumas, both physical and psychological, and how they affect our lives. According to the authors, traumas do not always lead to negative outcomes. In fact, their work proved quite the contrary. More often than not, even the severest physical and psychological traumas were found to result in positive outcomes for the people involved. The scientists had discovered that trauma has a flip side. Since the First World War, many psychologists had assumed that severe trauma would inevitably lead to physical and emotional disorders, and the various schools of psychology devoted their resources and research to finding ways to diagnose and treat post-traumatic stress disorder. However, according to Dr. Tedeschi and Dr. Calhoun, many people who experience traumatic events do not suffer any lasting psychological damage. In fact, their findings suggest that many people who experience severe trauma will, in the aftermath, look back on the trauma as a life-enhancing experience and enjoy some degree of personal or spiritual growth as a result. 
The doctor's findings confirmed something that philosophers and theologians have spoken of for centuries. Human suffering can bring with it possibilities for greater good. In their research, Dr. Tedeschi and Dr. Calhoun were primarily interested in traumas of a seismic nature, rather than ordinary or everyday stressful events. They focused on experiences that could be likened to personal earthquakes, experiences that would create upheaval in the trauma survivor's major assumptions and beliefs about the world, their place in it, and how they make sense of their daily lives. These experiences would often be unexpected, uncontrollable, and potentially or actually irreversible, such as a bereavement, receiving a diagnosis of a chronic or life-threatening illness, being injured in a car accident, losing limbs, and even being subjected to sexual assault or abuse. The doctors discovered that some people who experienced these kinds of traumas of earthquake proportions were actually less likely to suffer long-term negative or adverse effects, PTSD, than they were to look back on their experiences as positive defining moments in their lives that led to greater positive outcomes. Through their work, Tedeschi and Calhoun had identified a totally new psychological phenomenon, which they called post-traumatic growth. To understand exactly how trauma can be beneficial and lead to a feeling of personal growth, one needs to look to trauma survivors, people who have experienced severe trauma and come through it, feeling that their lives have been enriched as a result. While traumas can happen anywhere and at any time, there is one place where virtually everyone is subjected to severe traumas, and that is on the battlefield. The Traumas of War Finally, my prayers took a new turn to something like, OK, God, if this is the way it's going to be for however long, then God help me to emerge from this a better man in every way that I can. Help me to make it count for something positive. Captain Gerald Coffey, U.S. Navy In February 1966, Captain Gerald L. Coffey of the United States Navy was piloting an aircraft on a reconnaissance mission over North Vietnam. Captain Coffey's plane was the last to be launched on what was the last mission of the day. Neither he nor his crewmen made it back that day. The aircraft was hit by enemy fire, which severed the hydraulic lines. Without the hydraulics, Captain Coffey was unable to steer. The control stick froze in his hand as the plane careered towards the sea at over 680 miles per hour. I was knocked unconscious immediately, and for all practical purposes, had I never regained consciousness, I would have died then. Captain Coffey recalled. When he did regain consciousness, he found that he was floating a quarter of a mile off the coast. He would discover later that he had broken his arm and dislocated his elbow and shoulder. During the battle that ensued, his crewman was shot dead, but Captain Coffey was captured and taken to Wallow Prison in the capital city, Hanoi. I looked around and couldn't believe where I found myself, he said. I was in a tiny cell about the size of a single bed. There was a concrete slab about 18 inches wide jutting out from the wall which was to be my bed. At the foot of the slab was a set of ankle stocks, wooden on the bottom, with a heavy iron bar that came down across the top with a large padlock. There was one window very high in the cell with a double row of iron bars, he recalled. But all he could see from it was the prison's 18-foot wall. There was literally nothing in the room save for one small can in the corner. This was where Captain Coffey spent his days in prison. He had to survive the severest deprivation, interrogation and torture day after day, until one day, over seven years later, he was finally released. Yet despite everything he endured as a POW, when asked, Captain Gerald Coffey was adamant 
that he wouldn't trade those experiences. After the war, Captain Coffey wrote a book, Beyond Survival, considered by many to be one of the best books written on the Vietnam War POW experience. As news of his story spread, Captain Coffey became a sought-after motivational speaker and today is widely acknowledged as one of the top ten speakers in the USA. His presentations are not detailed accounts of his experiences in a Vietnamese POW camp, but he often draws from his experiences to inspire his audiences with a message of hope, faith, and the invincibility of the human spirit. At some time or another, we all get shot down. We are all POWs, prisoners of woe, he says. He challenges his audiences to be tough, bounce back, and learn not just to survive, but to go beyond survival, finding the purpose in your adversity. Captain Coffey talks about leadership when under stress, managing change through uncertainty, working within a team, the value of loyalty and the power of communication. The most important lessons that I learned, which contributed to my survival and that of my contemporaries during all those years, he said, have served me so well since I have been at home and will continue to serve me well in the future. Matthew J. Friedman, professor of psychiatry at Dartmouth Medical School and director of the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, said that studies of combatants, even as far back as the Second World War, showed that returning soldiers often found that something in their experiences had changed them in a profound, even spiritual way. Yes, I've suffered, soldiers would report. But I wouldn't have given up this experience for anything in the world. The things I experienced have made me a better man today. Many soldiers believe that even after being badly and permanently injured or confined in a POW camp for years, their experiences had changed them. They had come through their trials, feeling stronger and more resilient than they had ever been. These accounts are not meant to imply that war is a good thing. Drs. Calhoun and Tedeschi stress the fact that they regard all life crises, loss and trauma as undesirable. Any growth that results from a trauma emerges from the struggle with coping and overcoming rather than from the trauma itself. What they have demonstrated, however, is that even after enduring the traumas of war, it is still possible to find a flip side. The Central Park Jogger Life holds a potential meaning under any conditions, even the most miserable ones. Dr. Viktor Frankl The sun had set over Central Park. It was around nine o'clock in the evening of the 19th of April, 1989. A loosely organized gang of 32 youths was running amok in the park. Five of the youths later confessed to random, motiveless assaults. In a half hour of senseless violence, over a quarter of a mile stretch of the park, they assaulted cyclists and pedestrians, and in two separate incidents, reportedly, pummeled two men into unconsciousness with a metal pipe, stones, punches and kicks to the head. A few hours later, the body of a 28-year-old woman was found by two men walking through the park. The woman had been jogging and was found comatose, having been severely beaten and raped. Her skull was fractured from a violent blow to the head. She had lost over 75% of her blood and by the time she was found was suffering from severe hypothermia. The doctors at Metropolitan Hospital did not offer an optimistic prognosis. They initially thought that she wouldn't survive her injuries, or at best would remain in a coma. But, against the doctor's predictions, the woman, who became known as the Central Park Jogger, survived. Due to the social stigma associated with being the victim of a sexual crime, and the trauma that victims of these crimes must endure, 
the identity of the Central Park jogger was not revealed by the majority of the American media. However, in 2003, Trisha Maley revealed her own identity in an effort to help other victims of similar crimes, and she told her story in a book, I Am the Central Park Jogger. Born and raised in Paramus, New Jersey and Pittsburgh, Trisha was a Phi Beta Kappa economics major at Wellesley College and a double graduate degree recipient, MBA and MA, at Yale University. After graduation, she went on to work as an associate at the Wall Street Investment Bank, Salomon Brothers, until her life, as she knew it, was ended violently on that horrific night in Central Park. Trisha's book is an uplifting account not of her attack, but of her journey of healing and of the new life she built for herself. She had to rebuild her entire life, relearning how to do even the simplest thing, rolling over, being able to tell the time, buttoning her blouse, tying shoelaces, or identifying simple objects. Things we all learned to do as infants, Trisha had to relearn. She did it all, and in the process completely transformed herself. She was the same person, but she was changed, in some ways stronger than she'd ever been. Trisha is no longer an investment banker. Instead, she gives her time to help organisations that helped her in her recovery, including the Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Programme, SAVI, at Mount Sinai Hospital, Gaylord Hospital, where she did much of her rehabilitation, and the Achilles Track Club that helped her run the New York City Marathon in 1995. Recently, Trisha received the Leadership Award from the National Centre for Victims of Crime, the National Courage Award from the Courage Centre, the Pacesetter Award from New York Hospital Queens, the Spirit of Achievement Award from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the Courage Award from Boston's Magic 106.7 Exceptional Women Program, and she was an Olympic torchbearer in New York City. Today, Trisha is in demand as a public speaker and travels across North America to address businesses, universities, brain injury associations, sexual assault centres and hospitals about her journey of recovery and healing. With her book and her lectures... She offers insights on how to manage unpredictable change in life, whether personal, professional, economic, or even spiritual. Her story has encouraged and inspired people all over the world to overcome life's obstacles, regardless of what they might be, and get back on the road to life. She's a living example of what is possible on the flip side of trauma. She did not just survive, even though that was miraculous in itself, she managed to find the flip side of a horrendous experience. She was able to find something positive from it that would change her life for the better and inspire others to do the same. Growth through trauma No one would suggest that trauma is good or necessary for us to achieve personal growth. Trauma, by its very nature, involves suffering And, in an ideal world, we would all learn to grow within ourselves without having to suffer. But when it does happen, there is still hope for the future. Leading psychologists have demonstrated that all trauma brings with it unique opportunities that can lead to profound changes. Post-traumatic growth is a fascinating and relatively new field of study. Throughout history, Philosophers and theologians have spoken of human suffering bringing possibilities for greater good. Studying people who have grown or directly benefited in one way or another as a result of having been subjected to a physical or psychological trauma, Professors Calhoun and Tedeschi were able to establish that trauma has two sides, the side we see of loss and suffering and the side of growth and new possibilities. Through their research, the doctors discovered that people who go through major traumas, including life-threatening illnesses, severe accidents, criminal attacks, and even natural disasters, 
often experience one or more of five kinds of positive changes in their lives. 1. A feeling of personal strength. Survivors of traumas often become more confident and self-reliant. The knowledge that they have survived the trauma gives people a feeling of optimism and a self-confidence that they can beat anything that may be thrown at them in the future. It is evident that big traumas can completely alter our beliefs about ourselves and what we are capable of achieving. 2. Closer relationships Traumas tend to bring survivors closer together with their families, friends and work colleagues. They realise that the quality of life is more about the quality of their relationships than anything else, and they put greater effort and greater time into building and developing meaningful personal relationships. They've increased compassion and empathy for others who experience setbacks and trauma, although interestingly, they often become less sympathetic in relation to other people's complaints about more mundane, everyday worries. 3. A greater appreciation of life Too often, it is only when we lose something that we really understand its value. But when people go through traumas, any losses that they sustain can serve to make them appreciate those things that remain. There is often a sense of thankfulness for having survived, together with a deeper appreciation of life than they had ever felt before. Suddenly, the world is filled with wonder, and everything that many people take for granted or miss completely, the trauma survivor will cherish. 4. A new personal philosophy of life and stronger spiritual beliefs. The spiritual growth that often results from a traumatic experience is very commonly reported by people who survive traumas. More often than not, the survivor has new and very different priorities in life. They begin to find some purpose or meaning to whatever suffering they've endured, and this in turn gives new meaning in their life. Consequently, they emerge with stronger spiritual or religious beliefs. 5. New Opportunities and Life Paths Even though traumas can shatter people's lives completely, when they start putting the pieces back together, often they will discover new choices, new opportunities and new dreams to pursue. The discovery of post-traumatic growth demonstrates that the flip side is not a random outcome. It is something that is real and comes with an assurance of new opportunities and hope for a better future. However, finding the benefit or experiencing growth following a trauma is by no means a guaranteed end result. The key to finding the flip side to any setback or trauma lies not in the nature of an event or a specific type of trauma. The secret to finding a positive outcome lies within the people who experience the traumas and how they respond to it. People who find the flip side are no different, in most ways, to everyone else. But psychologists have identified some critical differences. So it is to those people that we will now turn. Chapter 6 Reasons for Optimism Why there is reason for optimism when faced with any problem, setback or adversity. An optimist is someone who goes after Moby Dick in a rowboat and takes the tartar sauce with him. Zig Ziglar There is a group of people who are no more intelligent or hard-working than everyone else, but at school they get better grades. They are no different physically than the rest of us, yet they suffer from far fewer health problems. They have no genetic advantages, yet they live on average seven and a half years longer. When they do fall ill, despite being given the same treatments as other patients, this group of people recover faster and more comprehensively. These people are no better skilled or trained, yet in business they outperform their work colleagues and their competitors 
by as much as 88%. They also make more money and achieve a higher professional status. In virtually every area of their lives, these people tend to succeed and achieve greater things than everyone else. More significantly, they seem to have a knack of being able to get something positive out of any negative experience. These people don't belong to a particular race, colour or creed. The only thing that sets them apart from the crowd is their attitude and outlook on life. They are optimists. Psychologists define optimists as people who generally expect good things to happen. Pessimists, on the other hand, generally expect bad things to happen. The difference is solely one of expectation, a confidence in the future. But it is a critical difference, which, to a large extent, determines how our lives unfold. The luckiest man in the world. Do you know anyone who is more unfortunate than me? This is the first question that Se Kun Shan asks audiences when he's invited to speak at seminars and conferences. He stands before them, a man with no arms, a deformed left foot, his right leg was amputated below the knee, and he's blind in one eye. Most people struggle to think of anyone they know, or anyone they have ever heard of, who could be considered to have been anywhere near as unlucky as Se has been in his life. It is then that he confounds his audiences with his second question. But do you also know anyone who is as lucky as me? What could possibly make a man like Se feel like the luckiest man in the world? Why would a man whose life seems like it has been cursed feel so blessed? To many it seems incomprehensible. That is why what Se has to say is so important. Se's story goes back over 30 years to the day when he was still a teenager, working in a factory in Taiwan. The last thing he remembers of that day was walking barefoot through the factory, carrying steel rods. I was helping at the garment factory, he explained. All of a sudden, the steel rods I was carrying were sucked up by high-voltage wires. Making things worse for some reason, I had taken my shoes off that day, which made my whole body an electric conductor. Say was knocked unconscious immediately. He woke up two days later, feeling unbearable pain from his badly burnt legs and arms. Doctors had no choice but to amputate some of his limbs to save his life. He lost most of his right arm, his entire left arm, and his right leg below the knee. His right eye was severely damaged, and his left foot was deformed by the accident. With such injuries, it seems remarkable that Se considers himself today to be one of the luckiest men in the world. It is even more remarkable when you consider that several years later, Se completely lost the sight of his right eye when his sister accidentally hit it with a staple as she was mending his books. But, even with his severe physical limitations, Se considers himself to be very fortunate. Not just because he survived an accident that could so easily have killed him, but because of the life he has built and the person he has become through the challenges that he faced, which were forced upon him both by his accident and the resulting injuries. For the seven years following his accident, Say confined himself to his family's small rented apartment. The only short trips he made outside were to get a haircut. But I was not in exile, said Say. I was thinking of ways to take care of myself so as to start a second life. My body was confined, but my mind was free. Say patiently began to learn to live with his disabilities. He invented a special device that could be chained to what was left of his right arm, to which a spoon could be attached, so that Say was able to feed himself. He also designed a long hook which could be attached to the chain to unzip his trousers. He even learned to bathe himself. It was in his small room that Say decided that he was going to paint for a living. 
He'd enjoyed doodling on textbooks as a child during school lessons, and so he began teaching himself to sketch with a pencil in his mouth, finding it therapeutic to focus his mind on the creative process. I found peace and contentment in drawing, said Say, who even taught himself to sharpen pencils with his mouth holding a small knife. In his early twenties, Say put an end to his self-imposed isolation and joined two other self-taught peers in forming a studio, selling all paintings called One Step Behind. He insisted on moving out of his mother's home and had an artificial leg attached so he could move around. However, the most dramatic change in Tse's life came the day he met the well-known oil painter Wu Asun at Wu's art exhibition in Taipei. Wu was impressed by Tse's eagerness to learn and agreed to let Tse attend the class Wu gave at her university, free of charge. Wu also helped promote Tse's work. It was at Wu's class that Tse met his future wife, a pretty girl called Lin, who worked at a local electronics firm. To make up for the education he had lost following his accident, Tse finished six years of high school studies at the age of 30. He went on to win many art awards, and in 1987, he became a member of the Liechtenstein-based Association of Mouth and Foot Painting Artists of the World, which offers grants to hundreds of artists in over 60 countries. Today, Say's medium-sized oil paintings sell for over $5,000 apiece. In 2002, Say wrote his autobiography, which was adapted as a children's book a year later. The book was also made into a 30-episode TV series, in which he played himself as an adult. Say's life story has now become part of Taiwanese folklore and is included in textbooks for elementary and high school children. He's achieved something that very few people throughout history could ever hope to achieve, not just in Taiwan, but anywhere in the world. He has become something of a legend in his own lifetime. Today, Say is not just a painter. He is a motivational speaker and lecturer. According to reports, he lives in a second-floor apartment in Bangkiao, Taiwan, with his wife Lin Ye Chen and their two teenage daughters. When Lin described him in an interview as a man who beams love, warmth and light with extreme optimism, she was also revealing one of the keys to his success. The Greatest Cyclist of the Tour de France In the world of professional cycling, there is one man who still stands out above all others. He is a man who, at the time of writing, has won the Tour de France, widely acknowledged to be the most prestigious and grueling cycle event in the world, a record-breaking seven consecutive times, from 1999 to 2005. Among his many honours are four consecutive Associated Press Awards for Male Athlete of the Year, and he also won ESPN's ESPY Award for Best Male Athlete four years in succession. In 2003, he was named the BBC Overseas Sports Personality of the Year. His name is Lance Armstrong. As you can imagine, Lance Armstrong has become something of an icon in the world of professional road racing. His achievements are unrivaled. But there is something else about his story that is even more remarkable. Only a few years before he won his first Tour de France, Armstrong was diagnosed with cancer. It was on the 2nd of October 1996 that Armstrong was first diagnosed with testicular cancer. It is the most common cancer in men aged between 15 and 35. According to the UK's Department of Health's records, 46.2% of people get cancer at some point in their lives. If you're a man and are going to get cancer, then testicular cancer would be one of the better types to get. Provided the tumour has not metastasized, spread to other organs or surrounding tissue, the prognosis is usually good. Over 90% of patients recover. However, when Armstrong's test results came back, they revealed that the tumour had already metastasized. The cancer 
had invaded his brain and lungs. The prognosis was not good. There were a number of factors that were on Armstrong's side in his battle against cancer. He was relatively young, a supremely fit and strong athlete in peak physical condition, and this put him in good shape to withstand the onslaught of aggressive chemotherapy and surgery. He also had a lot of support from his family and friends. But there was one crucial factor that helped him triumph, even when confronted with terrifying odds. It was the same factor that helped him go on to win the Tour de France, the world's most demanding road race, not once, but seven years in succession. Lance Armstrong has the attitude of a winner. He is focused, single-minded, and always believes that he will succeed at anything to which he sets his mind. All the key attributes of an optimist. Health and Optimism When anyone is diagnosed with cancer, in whatever form, the one thing they need more than anything else is optimism. Clinical studies have revealed time after time that patients who expect a positive outcome are far more likely to experience a positive outcome. Scientists have investigated patients undergoing treatment for several different types of cancer and even patients receiving bone marrow transplants. The results were virtually identical in all cases. The optimists among the patients experienced fewer complications and had a much better survival rate. In one study of young cancer patients, optimists were found to have a much better survival rate after eight months than pessimists. A study of patients who had head and neck cancers came to a similar conclusion. The results revealed that the pessimists among them were far less likely than the others to be alive one year later. The optimists, among women who were diagnosed with breast cancer, experienced less distress before surgery and reported enjoying a better quality of life 12 months following their treatment compared to pessimists. Research into other health problems came to very similar conclusions. Patients who undergo coronary heart surgery are far less likely to experience complications or have to be re-hospitalized in the six months following their operations if they are optimists, and optimists enjoy a higher quality of life even up to five years after their surgery. There is something special about optimists that enables them to overcome all manner of health problems more speedily and completely than other people. In 1985, researchers in Holland began a 15-year study investigating whether and how optimism was related to cardiovascular disease in middle-aged men. A random selection of men was carefully screened to exclude typical risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including a medical history of stroke, diabetes, angina pectoris, heart failure, and any familial history. The researchers were left with a total of 545 men whom they tested for optimism and pessimism using a short questionnaire with just four questions. Over the following 15 years, the researchers followed the men's medical history and tested for any changes in the men's dispositional optimism at five-year intervals. In February 2006, the researchers published their findings. The results revealed that there was a strong and consistent association between dispositional optimism and about a 50% lower risk of cardiovascular mortality. At the same time, Hopelessness, which is defined as a sense of futility and negative expectations about the future and one's personal goals, and is thus very similar in nature to pessimism, was found to be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, including hypertension and atherosclerosis. Optimism was shown to reduce the risk of death from cardiovascular disease by a mass of 50%. In fact, the association between optimism and the risk of cardiovascular disease was found to be so significant that the researchers recommended that a person's level of optimism and pessimism should be added to the list of independent risk markers for cardiovascular disease in elderly men.
Other research studies have revealed that optimists live between seven and a half and 13 years longer than pessimists and are also more likely to recover from a range of serious illnesses than pessimists. This may be because pessimists tend to have higher blood pressure than optimists and that optimists have stronger immune systems. According to Dr. Becca R. Levy, Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Psychology at the Yale School of Public Health, optimists live longer and tend to enjoy better functional health throughout their lives. Dr. Michael F. Shire, Professor and Head of the Department of Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University, has been involved in research looking at the effects of optimism on patients undergoing coronary bypass operations and cancer. He concluded that optimists tend to adjust better to health threats and conditions than pessimists do. Many scientists suspect that the reason optimists fare so much better than pessimists in surviving health crises is because our expectations have physiological and biochemical consequences. New research is revealing that our expectations are extremely powerful in influencing physical and psychological changes in our body. Scientists have measured the resulting changes in the brain following our thoughts and, in particular, our expectations. From the release of natural pain-killing chemicals to alterations in how neurons fire in our brain, their conclusions are startling. The idea that thoughts or expectations can bring about improvements in our health and well-being is nothing new. As far back as 1811, Hooper's Medical Dictionary referred to what we know of today as the placebo effect, an epithet given to any medicine adapted more to please than benefit the patient. But what Hooper perhaps didn't understand is that the mind of a patient is often critical. Some would say more critical than any treatment that a patient may be given. Today, the placebo effect is a recognized medical phenomenon and is the standard by which all medicines are tested. It is generally acknowledged that if you give patients a bottle of sugar tablets but inform them that the tablets are the latest proven medicine that will cure their ailment, over one-third of patients, usually somewhere between 30 and 60 percent, will actually experience an improvement in their symptoms. This ends Disc 2.